What's up everybody, Gen X Dividend Investor here. In this video, I'm going to answer the question, should dividend investors love stock buybacks? As always, don't take what I say as financial advice, especially during these crazy stock markets. Of course, the markets may be bad, but I slept like a baby last night. That is, I woke up every hour and cried. <laughs> no, really, don't you think the market's weird? Every time one guy sells and another one buys, and they both think they're smart. Anyways, if you love dividend investing or corny financial dad jokes, then please smash the thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. Now I've gotten a lot of comments from people about stock buybacks, so I thought it'd be useful if I explained the pros and cons, as well as my perspective on why I like them. To begin with, companies can basically do four things with their cash. Number one, they can return it to shareholders via dividends and or buybacks. Number two, they can invest it in projects, ideally to grow. Number three, they can use it to acquire other companies. And number four, they can let their cash pile grow, ready for a rainy day. Stock buybacks are when a company reacquires its own shares, which then decreases the amount of outstanding shares in the market, and fewer shares means the remaining ones are worth more. Let's use an example so this makes sense to you. Take a gander at some of Apple's metrics in my best dividend spreadsheet tracker using my stock comparison tool. It lets you put in two tickers so you can quickly and visually compare them. Here you can see I put in Apple and Omega Healthcare. I normally put in two stocks in the same industry, so Apple and Microsoft would be more useful, but someone on my dividend discord had asked how many consecutive years of dividend increases OHI had, so I was looking that up. Anyways, we can see that Apple's market cap is around $2.4 trillion. If I scroll down a bit, we see that Apple's shares outstanding are around $16.5 billion right now. If you multiply Apple's shares outstanding by their current share price, which is around $145 today, then you get to $2.4 trillion, which is their market cap, aka market capitalization. You could also just have divided market cap by share price to calculate the shares outstanding. We also see that Apple had around 24 billion shares outstanding in 2006, and then their shares actually trended up for a few years, hitting a peak of around 26 billion shares in 2012-ish. So what would cause a company's shares outstanding to increase? Well, that happens when a company decides to issue more shares. And why would a company issue more shares? The answer is usually to raise money, though shares can also increase due to employee stock options and grants. It isn't necessarily bad if a company issues more shares. It depends on why they're doing it and what happens afterwards. For example, if they issue more shares to raise money to do a project which triples their revenue, then you're happy. If they issue more shares and the outcome isn't good, then you're not happy. Other ways companies can raise money, other than generating more cash flow from their own products and services, is to sell some of their assets, or they can get loans aka take on debt. So what happened around 2012 that caused a shift in Apple's shares outstanding strategy? Well, Tim Cook took over from Steve Jobs in 2011, and he started aggressively buying back shares, and thus we see a long downward trend. When companies buy back their stock, then each existing shareholder's shares are worth a greater percentage of the company. So right now I own 1,738 shares of Apple. Since there are about 16.5 billion shares of Apple, that means I own 1,738 shares divided by 16.5 billion shares outstanding, which equals about 0.000105% of Apple. So I guess I kind of own like a parking spot at their cool headquarters. Apple just reported record second quarter results with almost $90 billion in revenue and almost $24 billion of profit. They also announced a dividend hike of 7% and an additional authorization of $90 billion of share buybacks. So if they bought $90 billion of stock today at $145 a share, that would reduce their shares outstanding by about 620 million shares. So they would go from about 16.5 billion shares outstanding down to 15.9 billion shares outstanding, nudging their shares outstanding graph down even more. And then how much of Apple would I own? Well, 1,738 shares divided by 15.9 billion shares is 0.000109%. So them doing $90 billion of buybacks increases the percent of Apple that I own from 0.000105 to 0.000109% without me doing anything. So to reiterate, that's one reason why investors like when companies do buybacks, which is because existing shareholders immediately own a greater percentage of the company without spending any of their own money. What else happens when outstanding share count decreases from buybacks? Well, earnings per share, aka EPS, increases since there are less shares out there. Remember, earnings per share equals net income, aka profits, divided by shares outstanding. So when the bottom number of shares outstanding gets smaller, then EPS gets bigger. Other metrics also improve, like ROE, aka return on equity. So why does that matter if EPS gets bigger? Well, one reason is because some investors use P-E ratio to help determine if a stock is expensive or cheap. 
Since PE is share price divided by EPS, then as companies do stock buybacks and their EPS goes up, we also see that PE gets pressured down. PE is not a perfect metric to use in isolation, but understanding its trends in relation to others can be helpful. The median PE of the S&P 500 historically is around 15, though right now it's like a 35, which is part of the reason why people say the market is overpriced these days. A higher PE tends to mean stock prices are going up faster than earnings are, and or more buybacks are happening, which you probably know is also true these days. If management teams are buying back stock when prices are at all-time highs, then you want to ask yourself if the money couldn't be used for something better. Anyways, people like to see lower PEs as an indicator that a stock might be cheap. So that's another reason why investors like buybacks, which is they help push down PE, which in turn helps bring more investors to the table who might want to invest in cheaper stocks. One complaint about buybacks is that they can make EPS go up even though earnings might be flat or even decreasing, so some people feel that management does buybacks to obfuscate weak earnings. Looking at buybacks, we see that in Q1 we had $178 billion of share repurchases in the S&P 500, which is 36% more than we had in Q4 of 2020. We also had about $124 billion in dividends paid out in Q1 in the S&P 500, which means $302 billion in total was returned to shareholders via buybacks and dividends. This data from S&P Global shows us buybacks by sector in the S&P 500, and we can see that tech was the highest sector and did $56 billion worth of buybacks of the $178 billion that were done which represents almost 32% of all buybacks. In some sectors, stocks, it's not uncommon to see shares outstanding increasing, like in utilities or REITs, due to how they operate. What other reasons would a company buy back shares? Well, if they believe the stock price has fallen too much, then they might buy back because they feel the stock price is cheap, or perhaps they do it to improve their financial ratios. These days, it's not uncommon for companies to borrow money to buy back their shares, though that seems riskier in this potentially inflated market. It's also important to realize that some companies do buybacks and their stock price doesn't respond too favorably. Take IBM. They spent almost $50 billion on buybacks while their share price fell about 40%. That's why some people say that companies that are firing on all cylinders should do more buybacks, whereas companies that aren't performing as well should instead return more cash to shareholders via dividends rather than do buybacks. Another common thought is that companies should be spending more on R&D projects rather than do buybacks, but you also don't want to see management teams pouring money into failed projects. Take GM. They spent almost $70 billion on R&D and CapEx in the 80s, but their entire company was only worth around $25 billion by the end of the decade. So they wasted tons of money on projects that didn't return value to shareholders. The best companies in the world seem to be spending more on R&D and more on buybacks, companies like Apple and Microsoft, and they're also hoarding more cash as well. Once again, quality companies win in the long run, which is why I keep beating that drum in my videos. Be aware that many executives have compensation tied to hitting certain EPS targets or share price targets, all of which can influence what they do. One nice aspect of share repurchases is that it gives the management team flexibility. Look at Apple. They announced that they had authorized an additional $90 billion of share buybacks, but they didn't say when they were going to do it. So this gives the management team flexibility to do some or all of it whenever they want. And if times get rough, they don't have to do the buyback and Wall Street won't freak out too much. However, they don't have the same flexibility with their dividend. If they cut the dividend, then the stock usually sells off. So that buyback flexibility enables optionality for the management team, which is a reason to like buybacks. Another reason to like buybacks are due to taxes. Some countries have better tax rates for share buybacks as compared to dividends. Companies pay dividends to shareholders using after-tax profits, which then again investors may have to pay taxes on. You don't have to pay taxes on share buybacks until you actually sell shares, which gives shareholders the optionality to choose when they get paid and have to pay taxes, as opposed to the one with the dividend schedule of companies. Of course, you can still have awesome tax treatment with dividends if you understand how to optimize them. Another reason why you should love stock buybacks is because some research has shown that the share price rises when companies announce they're going to do a buyback, as that signals to the market that management thinks that the shares are undervalued, and that can also be a psychological influencing factor on investors, which can then further push the stock up. But studies have also shown that some companies have done buybacks for the main reason of giving manipulative boosts in stock prices to executives who are incentivized to do so. Anyways, another reason to love buybacks is that you generally don't want cash sitting around doing nothing or earning very low interest rates. Removing cash from the company books via buybacks can lift overall performance. Yet another reason to love buybacks is that after buybacks are done, it often allows a company to increase their dividend more in the future, because there are fewer shares out there on which the company must pay a dividend. Thus, buybacks make a company's dividend payout plan more sustainable over the long term. Note, that assumes the company isn't spending so much on buybacks that it jeopardizes the cash that their dividend needs. It comes down to you wanting a management team that has good financial acumen to make those decisions. 
So sure, I love my dividends, but I also like seeing each of my shares worth more of the company when buybacks happen, and I also like to see my portfolio value go up, which often happens as EPS goes up. I also like a more sustainable dividend path for my company that buybacks often enable. My conclusion is that I want my companies to do both dividends and buybacks as both push me towards my financial goals and desires, and quality companies can do this and do it well, and weaker companies can't. Thus, it isn't do I want dividends or do I want buybacks. For me, the answer is I want both. I want my cake, which is my ever-growing company, and I want to eat it too, which are my dividends. Honestly, dividend companies are the only case where you can have your cake and eat it too. One thing you can calculate with your companies is their net payout yield, which is the percent a company has given back to its shareholders through share repurchases and dividends based on a company's market cap. Example, if a company with a 500 million market cap has purchased 50 million of stock and has a dividend yield of 5% over the last year, its net payout yield would be 5% dividend yield plus 50 divided by 500, which equals 10%, which equals 15% net payout yield. It's also called total shareholder yield, and it's probably a more complete measure to utilize when you're quantifying what you're getting from your company, rather than just dividend yield. Some smart investors aren't fans of buybacks. T. Boone's Pickens, an American business magnate, once said, I don't like stock buybacks. I think if a company has the money to buy their stock back, then they should take that and increase the dividends. Send it back to the shareholder. Let them invest their money again from the dividends. But you can also find smart investors who love buybacks. In Berkshire's 2004 annual shareholder meeting, Buffett said, when stock can be bought below a business's value, it is probably the best use of cash. Then in an interview with CNBC in 2018, when asked whether Apple investors should be worried about the stock market being at record levels, Buffett said that buybacks make owning the iPhone maker a no-lose situation right now. He basically said, I'd rather have Apple stock price go down for one reason, and that's if it goes down, Apple is going to buy a lot of stock back, and is already buying stock back. Then he said, if it goes down 10%, it means they get to buy 10% more shares and my interest will go up 10% more for them spending that money. Buffett's right-hand man and Berkshire's vice chairman, Charlie Munger, agreed and said it was deeply immoral for executives to repurchase shares just to drive stock prices higher, but defended buybacks as a highly moral act if they're done in the interest of shareholders. Buffett doesn't pay out a dividend on Berkshire stock, but has been doing billions of dollars of buybacks himself as he sees buybacks as an effective way for management to invest in their business and to reward shareholders. And for the folks who think Buffett is a has-been, well, all I can say is broaden your time horizon for making that statement and don't let recency over-bias your analysis. Longer-term trends are almost always more useful, whether you're evaluating companies or people. Bottom line, dividend investors should love stock buybacks in their portfolios, and they should love dividends. That's another beauty of dividend investing. If you're investing in a basket of diversified quality companies, then you should win over the long run as you will be operating in a reverse Kobayashi Maru. That's right, the no-lose scenario. But, and it's a big but, you have to ride the simulation for decades and you need to have those rodinium hands. I'm sure you know this, but rodinium is considered the hardest material known to Federation science, more than 21.4 times harder than diamond. Of course, you need to research your companies and stay on top of them. Then just keep investing in all market conditions and I'm confident you'll win. If you don't know what Kobayashi Maru is, then I'm sorry you've lived such a sheltered life, but the good news is that you're in for a treat when you go watch Star Trek II Wrath of Khan. You can thank me later. Yes, I'm such a big nerd that I actually have been to a Star Trek convention once before, and I got to meet both James Doohan and Nichelle Nichols. And if you don't know who they are, then I'm sad, because I think there's a correlation between how much Star Trek you've watched and how well your portfolio does. Speaking of portfolios, M1 currently has an account referral bonus of $30 if you open an account per their requirements. The way it works is you click on my M1 referral link in the description of this video and then either open a brokerage account and fund it with $100 or open a retirement account and fund it with $500, deposits which need to happen within 30 days of you opening the account. Then you need to keep your initial deposit inside the new account for 30 days from the date of deposit to get however much they're offering. Now I'd like to shout out my latest YouTube subscribers who have signed up to support me on Patreon.com at the Aristocrat tier. So thank you Mike B and thank you Jordo003. As Patreon aristocrats, they gain access to my dividend portfolio tracker spreadsheet tool that I use in this video, along with they gain access to multiple private channels on my Discord, including one where I let people watch my videos before I release them to the public, as well as I often let you vote on which thumbnails I use for my new videos. If you made it to this point in the video, I ask you to please slam that thumbs up button, subscribe if you haven't yet, and click that bell notification. And don't forget to join my free dividend Discord, a place where thousands of dividend investors hang out and chat. Thanks for watching and hitting that thumbs up button, stay positive, and I'll talk to you again real soon. I am not a financial advisor, and these videos are for entertainment, inspiration, and educational purposes only. Investing of any kind involves risk. I am only sharing my opinion with no guarantee of gains or losses on investments.